in this section, we're going to discuss linear air resistance. And so this free body diagram illustrates this case. We have a projectile moving forward with a velocity vector v, which is a function of t. There's air resistance uh, f vector, which takes the form of negative b, some constant, times the velocity vector. So that acts in the opposite direction from the velocity. And then the diagram also shows weight. The differential equation given by Newton's second law is shown on the right here. Uh, m r double dot as a vector is equal to acceleration from gravity and then the acceleration from air resistance. We can write, of course, r double dot as v dot and you get that second equation on that second line there. Fortunately, in the case of linear air resistance, the acceleration components are separable and so we get the first equation m v x dot, so that's the acceleration in the x direction, that's just equal to the air resistance in the x direction. The second line shows the accelerations along the y direction, and in this case we have gravity and air resistance in the opposite direction from the velocity. The book starts with the simple case of horizontal motion. So now we have no motion along the y direction, and so we don't need to worry about the y component of the acceleration. We can rewrite this differential equation uh, as the equation shown here and then we can separate variables velocity uh, in the x direction on the left side, time on the right side, and we, we can integrate the differential equation. Giving us the solution indicated here on the left hand side we have the natural log of the velocity as a function of time divided by the initial velocity v sub x comma zero that's going to be equal to negative b over m times t time. We can rewrite that solution as v of x uh, as a function of time is equal to uh, v0 times the exponent of uh, negative b over m times t. Uh, and just to remind you, uh, ln, that's the symbol for natural log, and then lowercase e, uh, that's usually the notation for Euler's number, which is a number equal to 2.718 and a lot of other stuff because it's an irrational number. Okay, so we have the velocity as a function of time. We see it's this initial value times an exponential function. And now we'd like to use that solution to solve for the position x of t as a function of time. And so because vx of t is the time derivative of x with respect to time, we can integrate vx of t once, as shown on the bottom line there, to get x of t. You see that we need to incorporate not just the integral, but also the initial value x naught. And then we can plug in uh, the velocity into the integral there. You can see uh, circled the, the new integrand plus the initial condition. You may recall that the derivative of the exponential function is just equal to the exponential function itself. And so its integral is particularly simple as shown here in the red circle. And so the solution for x as a function of t is shown in the middle line here. We get a minus m over b at the far left times the initial condition times this uh, argument in the parentheses uh, an exponential is very similar to what we saw for the velocity minus one and then of course plus the initial displacement x naught if you look at the units of b over m what you find is it has to have the units of one over time indeed as we discussed in class anything that goes into the argument of the exponential function has to work out to have no units. And so that means that b over m, that's uh, 1 over a time. And so b over m times t, that's going to be equal to the time t divided by some scale factor tau, which represents an important time scale in the problem, as we'll see in a second. And so making the replacement using tau, we get this solution for x of t. So x of t is going to be some negative vx naught times that uh, time scale tau times all that argument there in the parentheses plus the initial value x naught. We can incorporate the negative sign at the very beginning of the right hand side into the parentheses and so rewrite uh, to get that second line. Now it turns out of course that vx naught times tau that's a length that has units of length velocity times a time that'll be a length. So we get a length times a strange argument uh, in parentheses plus the initial value. So now let's make a plot of both the velocity as a function of time and the displacement uh, to, to develop some intuition for what these equations are actually telling us. Here's a plot of velocity 
in blue and displacement in red. The initial velocity is vx0 and that's shown as being the beginning of the blue line and over time you can see that the velocity drops and then asymptotically approaches zero. This behavior for the velocity is completely consistent with our solution shown by this equation here. You can see that as t goes to infinity the velocity is going to drop to smaller and smaller values and so it will asymptotically approach zero. The displacement does something a little more complicated. It starts at x naught, so that's that line starting in red at x naught, and as time goes on it approaches asymptotically a finite value vx naught times tau. So that's that length scale we talked about that came out of the solution originally. Remember our solution for x looks like this. And so we can think about how this solution behaves in the limit for t equals zero and for t going to infinity. For t equal to zero, the term in parentheses becomes one minus e to the zero. e to the zero is just one, and so you get one minus one, which is zero. So you get zero for the first term in the solution for x of t, and so what you're left with is x naught. So x of t equals zero is x naught by definition. If we consider the case that t is going to infinity, so t getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the exponential e to the minus t over tau, remember that's the same as 1 over e to the t over tau. And so as t gets bigger and bigger and bigger, e to the minus t over tau is going to get smaller and smaller. It's going to approach 0. And so we see at the bottom of these equations, vx0 times tau times that term in the uh, parentheses, the second term in the parentheses is going to go to 0. The first term, of course, is 1. And so as t goes to infinity, we can see that x will approach this finite value vx0 times tau. This behavior is completely consistent with our expectations based on the plot. As we can see, the velocity gets smaller and smaller, but never quite reaches zero. And so the object continues to move forward essentially forever. Uh, but the displacement, the amount by which the displacement changes over time gets smaller and smaller because the velocity is dropping. And coming back to our figure illustrating linear air resistance, this behavior also makes perfect sense. You can see that since the air resistance depends on the velocity linearly, as the velocity drops, the amount of air resistance drops. So the amount of acceleration is dropping as the velocity drops. So as the velocity drops, there's less drag. And since there's less drag, the velocity sort of just peters out, tapers off to these values asymptotically approaching zero the displacement asymptotically approaches a finite value.